designing for. And um, that, that could be a problem if we, we're designing for a 25 degree temperature difference on the maximum load. And so, you know, when Magnus did his CFD analysis, he said, no, you could really do it for 30 degrees, but our 25 is a little bit of a safety factor. If there's a lot of fans that are pushing way more air through the server than what is needed, right? Then it will cut down the capacity of the system. And the, the hope is that there won't be too many servers that are irrational, right? It, 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 we've got to allow for some to be irrational. But um, it would be a problem if you had a, a servers that all had fixed fans that didn't vary. That's the way a lot of older servers are. That could be a problem. Um, but you know, it, we're not guessing at this. We've done measurements on a lot of different data centers and looked at the temperature difference and found that in most cases the servers are acting more rationally and we're getting that 20 to 30 degree temperature difference. Okay, so um, the, the thing, a lot of people ask about filtration on a um, airside economizer, what about the particles? And, and um, there's a little bit of, uh, I think, excess amount of concern about that, but nonetheless, uh, we're going to go ahead and have two levels of filters, as you saw in that diagram before. The first uh, three filters are going to be 30% efficient, and then the final uh, filters are going to be 85% efficient. So it should create a space that is way beyond, uh, as far as cleanliness, what is recommended in different standards, including there's an IBM standard out there for cleanliness in data centers. So we're being a little bit extra safe on that just because we don't want to have to explain why it's okay to not filter as much. So um, we're going there. And then the other thing that people are concerned about with airside economizers is the humidity control. And what can happen, uh, in, in this area we don't have high humidity. We don't, it's not like the East Coast or, or Texas. So we're not as worried about the, the summer months, but in the winter months when it gets cold, it can be very dry, right? A 30 degree outside air temperature is, when you bring that air and heat it up to 70 or 75 degrees, it can be you know, 10 or 20% relative humidity. So we are gonna have um, the ability to um, do some humidification on the colder days. And we have this atomizing humidification, it's not steam, it's very fine water droplets and will humidify on the return air path so the air absorbs it quickly and then that mixes with the, the dry and cooler outside air. If, if we do get an occasion, uh, occasional high humidity day in the summer, uh, we will be able to override and close the outside air and go into the recirculation mode. It won't happen, it might happen occasionally, a few hours per year, maybe 20 hours per year, we'll go into recirculation mode. It, it, it won't impact the energy uh, use to do it, to, to uh, turn off the outside air um, for those few hours. So, um, what, we, what we did for this project is we took the weather data and we plotted it, and this is in the psychrometric chart, which shows the temperature and the humidity. And you know, we analyzed in detail how many hours we would be able to economize and how many hours we would need to humidify and, and all these things. And, and the interesting thing is if the supply air temperature target is 70 degrees, and this is what Magnus was talking to us about, if it's higher, like 70 degrees, <coughs> we have so many more hours per year where we don't need to turn on the chillers at all. That is, we get full economizer. So in Sacramento, it's 6,800 hours per year, plus or minus, depending on the weather of that year, that we can run without chillers. If I said that our supplier temperature had to be 55, I would draw a different line here, and our full economizer hours would go from 6,800 down to probably 5,000 or 5,500. So it's significantly cut into the economizer hours. So that's why this change in the ASHRAE standard is, is a big deal. Then we've got a, um, the hours from where the te outside air temperature is from 70 to 95 that we'll be able to do partial economizer. So if you think about it, we're supplying air in at 70 degrees, it's coming out of the servers, let's say average around 95. That's our exhaust air temperature. Well, if it's 80 degrees outside, It'd be smarter to bring in 80 degree outside air than it would be to bring the 95 degree air back. So we're going to be economizing, quote unquote, when it's 80 degrees outside. 
In fact, we might be economizing all the way up to 90 or 95 degrees, which is an interesting thing, right? Remember, if it's 90 degrees outside and the return air is 95, we should be economizing because we'll get what, what is a quarter of the cooling, I'm sorry, a fifth of the cooling for free in that scenario when it's 90 degrees outside. So that partial economizer makes up 1,500 hours per year, and then we're left with just a handful of hours where we have to have the chilled water plant on, we don't get any economizer benefit. Now, when we're doing partial economizer, it also means partial chiller. So we'll have the chiller on and the economizer running during these partial hours, and then after that, it will be all chiller running and doing 100% of the cooling. So that's where there's the big win. If you get the return air, exhaust air temperatures high, your economizer starts to really shine. And think about Sacramento, is a, it's a hotter climate than the Bay Area, right? So in the Bay Area, this 6,800 hours goes up to like 7,500 hours. Yes? Is the temperature uh, supply, rec supply, sorry, is the temperature uh, supply air temperature or the rack? Uh, so the concept is that those two will be the same, okay? That the air, the supply air, remember you saw the diagram, it was the air coming through the fan <coughs> wall and going into the space, and that's the supply air temperature, and that's the temperature that goes into the rack. Okay, now, we are assuming a little bit of heat pollution, so we assume 70 degrees is our supply air temperature. This is all based on 70. But if there's a little bit of the servers that, uh, or equipment that doesn't have the air going into the hot aisle, some of it's leaking back into the space, well then maybe our average temperature inside the space is 75, but we'll still be, or 74, or something like that. We'll still be within, very <coughs> simply within the ASHRAE recommended uh, temperature, or the temperature into the rack. Does that answer the question? Or? Well, if there's no mixing or recirculation, yeah, I mean, the idea is no mixing. I mean, that's what we're shooting for, no mixing. It, okay, it's not always perfect, but, you know, the, the hot aisle um, will be enclosed physically, and they're, they're, when it's working properly, there will be no mixing. But there will always be a little bit of leakage, you know. Yeah. So is the landlord supplying the ducted returns or is part of their base yes. package? And the next presentation from Rightline will uh, explain that in more detail. This is a preliminary rendering. They've developed it since uh, further but of, of the rack system that will be part of the data center. And I, I don't know exactly you know, how the, the money is getting sliced and who's paying for what. You can ask the parties. But, but you know, this is the system that they'll want people to use. So it's, you could use, um, it, it's fairly flexible in that you have the, the power and data overhead. Um, this whole uh, structure will be there, but you can, it is flexible for a variety of different racks. And how much does that add cost-wise to a normal racking system? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> you can ask the racking folks when they talk about that. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Um, I'm not sure I was looking for the, the slide where it shows the whole data center. But there you go. How does that, how does the air, right-hand side get affected from being warmer. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, you know, what about the air that's all the way over here? Is it still going to have the same temperature? Or are we going to get a little bit of heating? Yeah, so we, you know, we have the same question. And so Magnus modeled, did the CFD model of the building and did assume a little bit of heat leakage, leakage and was saying that, look, you're going to be in good shape. Because you're gonna have, it's a lot of air. It's not like air conditioning air in a space like this where it's just a little bit going here and there. It's, it's a big piston and it's moving across this room in, in a matter of you know, half a minute and it's, you know, the whole room is flushed. So, so out of curiosity, which model is that? Was that uh, flow? Uh, which, which modeling software? But this was uh, Flowvent from Flowmix? Flow, Flowvent is the answer, yeah. In the back there, yeah. How do you plan to control the pressure across the racks? Because obviously they're not going to be full day one. How do you control the pressure from getting short-circuited down one row of racks that don't have panels in it and the others do? 
or even even when they're starting to fill up, how do you control the pressure within 